Ever since Stephen Hawking proposed that information is lost when it enters an evaporating black hole and is ultimately destroyed at the singularity, leading to the transformation of pure quantum states into mixed state, certain physicists have pondered whether a comprehensive theory of quantum gravity could preserve information through a unitary time evolution. However, how can this occur if information is unable to exit the event horizon without surpassing the speed of light. This observation effectively eliminates the possibility of Hawking radiation being the medium through which the missing information is transmitted. Furthermore, it seems that information cannot be reflected at the event horizon due to the absence of any distinctive properties associated with the horizon in its immediate vicinity. Leonard Susskind suggested a bold solution to this issue by asserting that the information is both mirrored at the event horizon and traverses through it, but is unable to escape. We have discussed this matter on the channel and the professor was very kind to share his knowledge. A link is in the description below. However, it is impossible for any observer to verify both scenarios simultaneously. From the perspective of an external observer, the time dilation at the horizon is so extreme that it gives the illusion of requiring an infinite amount of time to reach the horizon. In addition, he proposed the concept of a stretched horizon, which refers to a membrane position slightly beyond the event horizon at a distance of approximately one Planck length. This membrane is characterized as being both physical and thermally active. What happens when you fall into a large old black hole? I'm going to make the black hole large just so that the horizon scale is very large compared to the observer who falls in so that we can apply the equivalence principle. Things should be like flat space at the horizon. Um, and uh, the reason that it has to be old is a technical reason to which I'll come back, but it really uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't uh, diminish the importance of the question. Um, and there are, just as there were 20 years ago, there, there are two proposed answers to this question. One is that you die at the horizon. We thought we'd gotten rid of this one, but it's reappeared. Um, and the people who have resurrected this, this uh, to me, rather uh, uh, dramatic answer to the question um, did so, of course, for very good reason. Uh, Almeri, uh, Merolf, Polchinski, and Sully, uh, Aldo and Santa Barbara, uh, came up with a new thought experiment involving black holes, a very beautiful and subtle experiment which seem to, to revive this conflict between unitarity and the equivalence principle. Uh, Lenny Suskin quickly followed up with a paper in which I think he basically agreed uh, with, with uh, the dramatic modifications to physics in flat space, uh, though he disagreed about some of the details. Uh, how old the black hole has to be, uh, I'm going to call these people amps. So amps think that it only has to be as large as, uh, as old as R log R, where R is the Schwarzschild radius in Planck units. Everything will be in Planck units. Lenny thinks that it's the, uh, the page time scale, the time scale for half of the black hole to evaporate, which is the same order of magnitude as all of it to evaporate, uh, and, and of order R cubed in Planck units. Uh, but again, either way, the equivalence is, principle is badly violated. Um, uh, people who hit the horizon hit a kind of firewall or, 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 or a larger, enlarged version of the singularity. Uh, and the claim is that this is necessary to preserve the unitarity of the S matrix. Uh, the second possible answer to this question is uh, you freely fall through the horizon. And um, independently, I and Dan Harlow uh, argued for this point uh, in, in, a, in, in a couple of papers uh, uh, over the last week. Uh, Dan's just came out last night, if you haven't seen it. Um, and of course, this would be an easy thing to argue for if we're willing to give up unitarity, but we're not. We claim that complementarity, the same lesson that we learned from uh, the old thought experiments uh, in the early 90s, is still enough to save the day uh, and to let us have our cake and eat it. Now, um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pretend to you that this is going to be a completely unbiased talk. Uh, so I want to alert you to the following facts. None of the authors of the first viewpoint are present. Here they are. Uh, as you may be aware, they include uh, a number of people who I've known for a long time and admire more than just about anybody. And so uh, you should take them very seriously. Um, and uh, secondly, both of the authors of the second viewpoint are present. 
It's just that that's the way it worked out. It's you know divine intervention. Um, so just you know, as any good observer, beware of selection bias. Um, is this going to go forward? Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, I should also say that I'm not going to be able to give a complete or fair overview of all related literature. Uh, particularly, I want to alert you to bit models investigated by Giddings and, and others, uh, to fuzzballs. Um, all, all of these ideas have had some, some interplay with notions that you might actually ex experience something very dramatic at the horizon, though they did not contain the very subtle and, uh, to, to me, initially really disconcerting thought experiment that, that AMPS came up with. Uh, and of course, complementarity has a long history and, and many brilliant papers. Particularly, I want to alert you to Banks and Fischler, who've had a sequence of papers trying to implement this into a full quantum gravity theory that makes sense in cosmology. So I'm going to start by reviewing the old story of complementarity, uh, then telling you about the uh, AMPS thought experiment, uh, and, um, and, then, and then try to convince you that complementarity still saves the day. OK, so the idea of complementarity came suspiciously enough, precisely from this conflict between unitarity and the equivalence principle. Um, we're going to think about a black hole that forms uh, from a pure state, let's say, and, uh, and it's complete Hawking evaporation after a time scale R cubed. And uh, what's non-negotiable is that I will assume throughout this talk that this is described by a unitary S matrix. And I would think that in this audience, uh, I, I'm going to get away with that assumption. In any case, without that assumption, uh, no paradox. So, of course, to a particle theorist, this is very natural. You sit at infinity. This is a scattering experiment. Stuff comes back out. Why should it matter whether there was a black hole as an intermediate state? This is a fundamental principle of quantum mechanics. To a relativist, things are a little more confusing uh, because the equivalence principle dictates that experiments on scales much shorter than the horizon uh, experience nothing special that you should observe the same stuff that they would see in flat space at the time when an infalling observer crosses the horizon. This could be a black hole that's a billion light years across. Okay, so you would have a billion years to live after you cross the horizon. It's completely hard. We could be crossing it right now. Okay, and, and not know anything about it. Um, so so that's, that's important to the relativist. Uh, and, and now let's construct some contradictions. And I'm going to start with a more intuitive uh, a qualitative one and then move on to a quantitative one that, that, that can be um, explored quantitatively as well. Uh, the description from the outside observer's point of view uh, is that, well, you send some stuff in, then this object forms a black hole. It's like a membrane. You can probe it. It has electrical and mechanical properties. It has a temperature. It slowly fizzles away. In the end, it's disappeared into radiation. Of course, you know, this all makes sense. The S matrix is unitary. You formed something and it fizzled away. It's not that different from making a piece of coal that's hot and letting it fizzle away. Um, from his point of view, something special does happen to all the people who fall towards the horizon. They hit that membrane that he can investigate all sorts of physical properties of. They get thermalized by it and they eventually get returned to the outside as Hawking radiation. To him, it seems clear that an infalling observer should see a violation of the equivalence principle, but he just can't check himself. He doesn't want to fall in. He wants to be the outside observer. Otherwise, he has an identity problem. Now, according to the infalling observer, things are exactly the other way around. Uh, th these guys could fight forever. So, so d d he falls in with a star that's collapsing or whatever. He sees matter across the horizon harmlessly by the equivalence principle. Uh, and all the information, the particular pure quantum state this star was in, goes into the black hole unharmed un, uh, and, and uh, you know, there's nothing in the way. So to him, it's clear that the outside observer should see information loss. How could the information possibly get out if it just went into a black hole? By causality, it can't get out. Okay, so, so in fact, this, of course, uh, uh, this hand-waving story is, is much more uh, convincingly supported by, by Hawking's beautiful calculation that shows that apparently the, uh, um, the black hole takes a pure state to a density matrix. Um, now, these guys could argue forever, except, of course, they can't because the infalling observer is inside the black hole and the outside guy had to wait for all the Hawking radiation and so that's going to be important. Uh, one thing I want to say is that all the apparent conflicts I'm going to talk about arise in, um, in a regime where we think we have control. This is not somewhere near the singularity inside the black hole. Again, think of the black hole as a billion light years across. We, we understand physics in this regime. 
We can't appeal to some miracle coming from, you know, Planck scale corrections. Um, so so it's, 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 it's a really robust contradiction, it seems. To make it even sharper, uh, let's now consider the evolution of a quantum state in the presence of this black hole. So here's the star. Uh, this is a Penrose diagram. Light rays are at 45 degrees. This is the singularity. This is the horizon of the black hole. Here's R equals zero. Uh, here's future infinity, past infinity. These orange lines are time slices. At some early time, you have the star, which is about to collapse. It's in a pure state psi. At a later time, you have, well, what? We're going to use the Heisenberg picture. So, psi just evolves into psi. So, after the black hole has evaporated, out here you have this green thing. That's the Hawking cloud that's moving out towards infinity. By unitarity, by assumption that we have a unitary S matrix, that's in the state psi. That Hawking cloud is psi. Okay. Um, now, at the same time, at a space-like related distance, in other words, uh, inside the black hole, we have this star happily collapsing away. And again, I can choose this so that this is still very far from the singularity and curvatures are not high. Uh, and the star, by the equivalence principle, crossed in unhindered. Nothing happened to it. It's still in the quantum state psi. So the black hole, it didn't matter what psi was, of course. So the black hole acts as a quantum xeroxing machine. It takes psi into psi cross psi, which violates the linearity of quantum mechanics, as you can check in one line. So by trying to save unitarity, we, we, we screwed up some other principle of, of quantum mechanics. And again, you're starting to see a pattern here. No observer can see both copies. You know, what, what, to see both copies, you'd have to find a past light cone of some point in this diagram that contains both copies. And as you can see, there isn't one. Now, maybe that's just because of some vicious way that I drew the diagram. It seems all rather arbitrary where I put things. Uh, so you need to do a calculation. And the first, so, so, and, and of course, when you do a calculation, you try to find the best possible strategy for seeing both copies. Okay, so the strategy that Suskin and Thorlacius came up with in 1993, in one of a sequence of early papers that established the uh, notion of complementarity, um, you have an early observer who falls in with the uh, with a star, uh, carries a bit along with her, Alice, um, and as soon as she crosses the horizon, as fast as possible, that's the best case. She tries to send this bit over to Bob up along the horizon like this, inside the black hole, but you know, as fast as possible, out to Bob. Now, if Bob stays outside forever, he'll never be able to see that bit. Uh, but what Bob wants to do, he wants to stay outside long enough to see the Hawking radiation copy of that bit, and then quickly jump in and receive Alice's second copy and verify that, that this horrible thing, quantum Xeroxing, has taken place. Okay, so why doesn't this work? It doesn't work because of a beautiful result by Page that you have to work, wait for half of the evaporation time of the black hole. This is quite general in a maximally entangled system. If you look at a, a subsystem, if you're in a typical state and you look at it less than half of the system, it'll look like it is, it's in a, in a thermal density matrix. You get no information, even if the whole system is in a pure state. You have to look at at least half. A little bit more than half, you get your first bit. You can arrange for that to be Alice's bit uh, if you have enough control over the, the measurement and if you know the S matrix. But you have to wait that long. Okay, so, so Bob has to wait for half of the black hole to evaporate, measure the Hawking radiation version of Alice's bit, then jump in and try to see the other copy, and he fails by a lot. And this, again, that's a calculation. I won't show it. Uh, but, but basically, the point is that Bob pretty soon hits the singularity no matter what he tries to do. And he has to receive Alice's bit before that happens. And because of enormous exponential redshifts between Alice's infall time and Bob's near the horizon, uh, Alice has to send her signal with an exponentially large frequency. In other words, in a quantum whose mass is exponentially larger than that of the entire black hole. It's not even close to possible. Okay, so it's actually a little funny that we fail by this much. And uh, it'd be more convincing if we got, if it, just, if it was just barely impossible to see both copies. And, and that's what Hayden and Preskill, they, they, they came up with a second strategy where you just barely fail. And that, to me, made it much more convincing. I won't describe it in detail, but you basically have a black hole that's already old. Half of it has evaporated. Bob holds, uh, has control over that early Hawking radiation. Uh, it's maximally entangled, therefore, with the black hole. Now Alice drops a bit in. Turns out that the black hole basically returns that bit immediately, limited only by the time scale for scrambling or thermalization, mixing in into all of the black hole's degrees of freedom. Uh, and, and, and then Bob, so Bob gets it back quickly, jumps in, tries to see 
Alice's copy of the bit just as before. This time he misses just barely. Okay, so at first it seems that we have to choose between these two principles, unitarity and the equivalence principle. Um, but what, what these thought experiments show when we, when we look at it uh, more carefully, we realize that there's another hidden assumption which we could give up instead. Omniscience. The idea that there has to be a consistent description of the entire global space time. If we insist on that, yes, then there are two copies made from one. That's bad. But if we ask only about what any one observer can see, well, any one observer does not see quantum Xeroxing. And so complementarity is simply the decision to sacrifice three in order to preserve one and two. Okay. And so what, what do we say more generally about this? I mean, it, it has to make something this, this radical that we, we're not allowed to think about space-time globally surely cannot be restricted to the context of just special solutions like asymptotically flat black holes. How would you draw a line? Um, and so we have to have a statement that makes sense more broadly. Uh, well, we can ask what is an experiment that we can actually do consistent with causality, but not, you know, any practical limitations like the fact that we die or whatever. Uh, so then you consider a world line that's as long as you can make it, so you stop it only when it hits a singularity or never, um, and you look at the past light cone of the end point of that world line and the future light cone of the starting point that's called a causal diamond, and that denotes a region which is in some sense maximal. You can't probe anything that, that's larger than that causal diamond consistent with causality. Now, you have to have a theory for every such causal diamond, otherwise physics is somehow incomplete. But you don't need to have a theory for many of them put together, even, even if they have overlaps. That's more than, than that's asking for uh, consistency for experiments that can, nobody can actually perform. And, and it looks like maybe that's where the problem lies here. Um, so if you have a contradiction between different causal diamonds, um, Alice says that the information is inside the black hole. Bob says it's in the Hawking radiation. Too bad. They can't argue with each other. Every, the important thing is that each one of them has a co consistent description with not, no obvious uh, intrinsic conflicts. Okay. And as the thought experiments uh, that I showed uh, demonstrate, complementarity resolves the apparent paradoxes that people exhibited uh, had exhibited until about two weeks ago. Okay, but, but now there's this very beautiful new thought experiment that, that uh, uh, AMPS came up with, and we need to see whether uh, complementarity uh, resolves this. First, I need to tell you what it is. So here again, uh, it doesn't display that well, but Maybe you can see one thin black line that going through the point B, that's Alice jumping into the black hole. That red thing here is her causal diamond, okay? It's, all of this is the region that Alice can probe. Uh, that blue thing here is the causal diamond of an observer who stays outside, such as Bob. And uh, the overlap region I've made purple, since I'm very logical. And uh, these black dots here, they're supposed to denote the early Hawking radiation. What we're doing here is, we're waiting for the black hole once again to evaporate, just like in Preskill and Hayden. We, 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 we let it evaporate half of its mass, but it's still supposed to be big compared to, um, you know, observer scales and Alice's size and so on. Um, and so the early Hawking radiation, that more than, let's say, 90% of whatever is already evaporated, that is maximally entangled with what remains of the black hole. Uh, equivalently, it's maximally entangled with the remaining 10% that are still to come out of the black hole the late Hawking radiation. Now, let's consider, we're not interested in all of the late Hawking radiation for this argument, at least not for now. Uh, let's consider one of the quanta in this 10%, in the late Hawking radiation. Well, if the early radiation is maximally entangled with the late radiation, which it has to be because, uh, well, we assume that the black hole is in a typical state where everything is maximally entangled. Um, then it must in particular be entangled with this one quantum B. You can think of quantum, this quantum as some sort of wave packet of the typical Hawking uh, wavelength uh, for the Schwarzschild radius. And we're going to focus on this quantum B, uh, which is barely visible up here in blue and, and, and black. Um, 
So now we're going to go back to this observer Alice who falls into the black hole and I'm going to arrange things so that Alice crosses the horizon when B is still close to the horizon. So I'm, I'm, I'm following this Hawking particle back to the horizon. Uh, some distance much greater than the Planck length away from the horizon so that I have control. Uh, but I want it to be much smaller, the distance from the horizon, I want it to be much smaller than a Schwarzschild radius away from the horizon so that I can apply flat space intuition on the, on the scale of this quantum. Curvature scale is much larger than the scale I'm going to experiment on. Uh, th so again, the idea here is that Alice and Bob stay together, wait for 90 percent of the black hole to evaporate, then Alice jumps in and I'm going to ask a question about one of those late quanta that hadn't evaporated by the time she decided to, 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 uh, to jump in, but which is sort of on its way out to Bob as she crosses the horizon. Okay. Or more precisely, amps uh, asked about this. Um, so now, we, again, we can construct a contradiction. By the equivalence principle, Alice should see flat space physics on a scale much shorter than the Schwarzschild radius uh, near the horizon. Uh, but flat space physics means we should be in the Minkowski vacuum. There should be no dramatic things happening. Uh, and as you know, in the Minkowski vacuum, just think of Rindler space. You have some surface dividing Minkowski space. You think about modes that have support only on one side. Those are modes that sort of fill up the right Rindler wedge, modes that have support only on the other side. You can write the Minkowski vacuum as a sum over products of such modes. It's a highly entangled state. You have to sum over products of left and right modes. And so uh, that's what the Minkowski vacuum is. Okay. Um, so for, for Alice to see maximal, to, to see flat space physics, she has to see maximal entanglement between modes on the right and on the left of this dividing line. And B is a mode that's on the right with support only on the right. Um, so, so she has to see B maximally entangled with C. And recall, please, that that we had already decided that B has to be maximally entangled with A according to Bob by unitarity. And that's a contradiction um, one can show and, and quantum, quantum information people have shown us that, that a system cannot be maximally entangled with two distinct other systems, okay, both with A and with C. So that's a contradiction. So we must give up it seems either unitarity, uh, the entanglement of B with A, that came from unitarity, uh, or quantum field theory. I guess we could imagine that there's something that breaks down in evolving this Hawking quantum backwards and forwards from the near to the far from the horizon region. Uh, but why? I mean, everything is way above the Planck scale. Um, or third option, we have to give up the entanglement of B with C. In other words, we have to give up the equivalence principle. And that's what AMPS argue is the most conservative choice. But it's an extremely, ra even if it was the most conservative choice, uh, it's an extremely radical conclusion. Right? The lack of entanglement of short distance modes across the horizon implies a divergent stretch, uh, uh, stress tensor at the stretched horizon. Right? It, it, think of the Rindler vacuum. This is similar to being in the Rindler vacuum. Uh, when you compute the stress tensor, there's a sort of delta function singularity at the horizon. This is true for, for any pure uh, render status as Van Ramstonk recently showed and his collaborators. Um, so what's going to happen to Alice if we give up the equivalence principle and say that there's no entanglement here and you know we can argue this for shorter and shorter wavelength modes. They all correspond to stuff that's later going to get out to, to, to Bob. Uh, so we're going we're to encounter a singularity there. This is the firewall that AMPS conclude has to be there. Alice isn't going to make it in. She's going to hit the firewall her description is actually going to be the same as the outside observer's description. You fry at the horizon. Um, Suskind argued that nevertheless, you still need complementarity to resolve other paradoxes. And that's kind of inter interesting that the most obvious motivation for complementarity namely the apparent conflict between the, you know, just the description of the outside observer, you fry at the horizon and, and the equivalence principle, you, you make it right through. That would have gone out the window and nevertheless you still need this principle for more subtle reasons. Uh, that's one reason why it, um, 
It, it just seems it would be very unfortunate. Uh, but, but I think the most important reason is just, I mean, giving up the equivalence principle seems like an extremely radical conclusion. So let's see if complementarity can resolve this paradox. So this is uh, uh, the work of Dan Harlow and my own work uh, independently of each other. Um, and I'll give you the upshot first. And the upshot is easy to convey by, by just drawing an analogy with the resolution of the Xeroxing paradox. That's here on the left. Here's the inside copy of Psi. Here's the outside copy of Psi. Each observer, blue and red causal diamond, sees only one copy. The resolution of the firewall paradox is going to be that each observer sees only one entanglement. Here we have two incompatible entanglements. Each observer can actually only verify one. Let's see how that works out. So the infalling observer, Alice, well, she will find indeed that the early Hawking radiation is consistent with unitarity. Those 90% everything is exactly as Bob's S matrix predicted. But notice, and this is a very central point, notice that Alice does not even in principle have access to the full S matrix. If Alice is going to be what we say she is, an infalling observer after 90% of the Hawking radiation, Alice is not going to see the remaining 10%. Alice does not have any operational way to verify the unitarity of the S matrix. It's a little bit confusing because, you know, the first 90%, uh, uh, you know, we're all consistent with unitarity, so it seems so natural to extrapolate and just use unitarity of the full S matrix in Alice's description of the universe. But, but complementarity is all about being really uh, nitpicky about these things. <laughs> And, and, and she doesn't see the, she has no access to the remaining 10%. She does not get to use any alleged properties those 10% have according to a different observer. Okay, so she can consistently assume, therefore, since B doesn't have to be entangled with A, uh, that B is entangled with C. Um, notice that this implies that there's a different theory for, for different infalling observers. This is quite consistent with what I told you earlier. Since different infalling observers who fall in after 85 or 90 or 95 percent of the Hawking radiation uh, also have different causal diamonds. Uh, there are alternative statements with, about what complementarity means that I think are somewhat misleading. Like there's, there's a map between degrees of freedom in the inside, to, that there's some sort of scrambled version of the Hawking radiation. I think that's misleading. For example, it doesn't even make sense to speak about all of the degrees of freedom inside the black hole at the same time, according to the restriction to a causal diamond. Nobody can see them all. Now, Bob, Bob has a different story. He can measure the full S matrix. He can't probe the horizon under free fall. He has no reason to insist that B should be entangled with C. And so he can consistently uh, say that there's no contradiction. He measures the S matrix. It's unitary. B is entangled with A. Everything's fine. Okay, each, each person sees one entanglement and not the other. Now, I oversimplified slightly. There are still some quantitative checks that one should do to see that this really works out. Um, Alice, on her way in, for some time, still has a chance to send a message to Bob about quanta she encounters on the way in. In fact, she could just change her mind and decide not to fall in after she measures some of these quanta, accelerate really fast, stop, and go back out. Um, and so experiments, it turns out, up to one Planck time before Alice's free fall hits the horizon, those experiments have to agree between the two observers. And so that seems problematic because it seems like, and this is what Dan checked, um, it seems like Alice could measure um, the quantum B um, needed to be not entangled with A so that she later uh, sees C and, 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 and can find it entangled with B. Uh, but on the other hand, she could still turn around, in which case B should be entangled with A because she becomes an outside observer at the end and, and, and sees that unitarity should hold. But in fact, there is no contradiction. Um, Harlow has shown that Alice is just barely unable uh, to, so what we imagine is that there's an earlier, uh, an earlier Hawking quantum that came in. It has to get at least far enough away from the horizon that Alice crosses it, in, it crosses it in more than one Planck time. That condition turns out to mean that Alice will not be able to receive a signal from some fiducial observer who, who hits this quantum at an earlier time inside the horizon and tries to send it over to Alice. It's the same, it's the same uh, very similar contradiction to that uh, found by Preskill and Hayden for a different thought experiment. 
So, the upshot here is that Alice can verify the entanglement on her way in, in the entanglement of B with A if and only if she can not verify the entanglement of B with C and it works just barely. It's the same time scale R log R that enters into this calculation. So, so again there seems to be a conspiracy against somebody seeing both entanglements uh, as, as, as Dan showed. Okay, so I want to close by just saying that uh, amps have more arguments. I gave the one that's the cleanest. It doesn't require any, any uh, uh, particular measurements on the Hawking radiation. Uh, it's, it seems incredibly uh, simple and, and, and so at first there seem to be very few loopholes. There are more quantum complicated things you could try to do, uh, but they also have more loopholes and uh, I'm sure that we'll be working on more thought experiments in the near future and the discussion is far from over. Um, nevertheless, I believe that for now the equivalence principle uh, remains safe. Uh, I, I believe the AMPS thought experiment has, has shown us very clearly what complementarity means and does not mean. Um, they'll probably won't agree with me uh, right now and again I want to alert you to that. You should read their viewpoint, you should read their papers, but I think no matter how this plays out in the end uh, we will have learned something very important. Thank you. When information falls into the extended horizon, it causes the horizon to get hotter. This heat is subsequently emitted as Hawking radiation, and the entire process follows a unitary evolution. Nevertheless, from the perspective of an observer plunging into the black hole, there is no significant occurrence at the event horizon. Instead, both the observer and the information they possess will ultimately reach the singularity. This does not imply that there are two identical copies of the information present one near or just beyond the horizon, and the other within the black hole, as that would contradict the no-cloning theorem. Conversely, an observer can alone perceive the information either at the horizon itself or within it, but never both concurrently. Complementarity is a characteristic of non-commuting observables in quantum physics. Susskind suggested that both narratives are complementary in the quantum sense, implying that there is no contradiction or violation of linearity in quantum mechanics. An observer falling into a black hole will perceive the information entering at a specific point on the event horizon. On the other hand, an observer outside the black hole will observe the information spreading evenly across the entire stretched horizon before being emitted again. This external observer views the event horizon as a dynamic membrane. From the perspective of an observer plunging into a black hole, the passage of information and entropy via the event horizon is uneventful and lacks any significant occurrences. From an external perspective, the information and entropy are assimilated by the extended horizon, which functions as a dissipative fluid possessing entropy, viscosity, and electrical conductivity. The stretched horizon conducts surface charges that rapidly disperse logarithmically across the horizon. For the experts watching this video, I have just inputted the concept that the horizon is like a membrane, a true membrane that can be probed. This is amazing. A membrane that conducts surface charges and rapidly disperse it. The concept of black hole complementarity, along with the principle of entanglement monogamy, suggests the presence of a hypothetical AMPS firewall at the black hole horizon. In black hole physics, complementarity is a significant collection of concepts that address the black hole information conundrum. The physics literature on black hole complementarity presents a sequence of thought experiments that provide compelling justifications for embracing the operational principle and dismissing the descriptive principle. If we are willing to accept instrumentalism, then operational complementarity might be enough to overcome the black hole information dilemma. The development of a practical definition of black hole complementarity has played a crucial role in the recent scientific discussions over the black hole information paradox. This literature demonstrates that efforts to identify detectable deviations from quantum mechanics within the dilemma are unsuccessful, provided that we confine our analysis to physics beyond the Planck scale. However, attempting to describe complementarity in a detailed manner is not successful, 
The simultaneous use of both the exterior and infalling descriptions leads to breaches of quantum physics. The lack of descriptive complementarity success may not come as a surprise to scientific realists. The black hole information paradox revealed a discrepancy in the implementation of quantum physics in relation to black holes. Considering the presence of an inconsistency, it is unsurprising that the inconsistency manifests itself in various forms across different thought experiments. One can engage in physical locomotion, yet it is impossible to evade detection or avoid being found. However, realists should be astonished by the triumph of operational complementarity, the inability of the inconsistency to propagate into an experimental issue presumably indicates something about the underlying descriptive theory that would answer the information paradox. This can be compared to the situation in special relativity, where the fact that observers cannot reach a consensus on which events occur simultaneously indicates the underlying structure of Minkowski spacetime. In quantum physics, the wave function's existence is indicated by the fact that observers cannot measure accurate quantities of location and momentum simultaneously. Therefore, even those who adhere to a realistic perspective must acknowledge the significance of operational complementarity's achievements, as it offers valuable insights and a fresh avenue for further advancements in the field of physics. However, individuals who do not oppose operationalism in physics may find that the resolution of the black hole information conundrum is indicated by the achievement of operational complementarity. In other words, no experiment can be conducted to reveal any conflict. Therefore, according to operationalists, if future research does not disprove operational black hole complementarity, then there is no remaining paradox.